depression, frustration, anxiety, pain, disillusion. It's just a natural part of the process of becoming a stronger version of yourself. Because problems are what make us grow. Problems are what sculpt our soul. Problems are what make us become more. If we can realize that life is always happening for us, not to us, game over. All the pain and suffering disappear. Your problem is your gift. You're carrying dead weight. And because you got all this dead weight and you're operating over your capacity, it's going to take you that much longer to get there. If you don't know your starting point, friend, you're never going to get to your end point. And so we're being honest and we're being vulnerable and we're looking within and saying, who am I really? And Tozer would say to you and I, you want to know who you are? Just check the circle of your friends. You cannot get there with all of the people that you showed up with because your boat is at its capacity. If the boat is at 1,500 and because you're loyal, you have your boat now at 4,000 pounds in capacity. You are now on a boat that has blessings and opportunities, but it's it's overweight. It's past its capacity. It don't matter what your mama think. It don't matter what your co-workers think. It don't matter what your siblings think. It don't matter what your children think. It don't matter. They have nothing to do with it. This decision is yours and yours alone. You get to decide. Let me tell you something. You get to decide if I'm going to be rich, poor, mediocre, happy, sad. You, you have a decision to make. As you grow up and get older, you start realizing what actually makes sense for your life and what don't make sense for your life. Because I grew up with my brothers and sisters doesn't mean that we're actually going to walk in the same path because I have my friends that I grew up with doesn't mean that we're going to move and walk and have our lives, family, mind state, career choice, the way we think, the way we move, moving in the same direction. And you should understand this, that it was always going to be your family and your friends that would be the first ones to try and talk you out of your vision and your big idea. That's why you're supposed to live your life Focus on your intentions and do your thing. If I had paid attention to what people thought I was going to do with my life and what my career path would be, I would not be Tyrese Gibson. Character is self-imposed discipline for the sake of moral convictions. Self-imposed discipline. That means a person of character doesn't need the police they police themselves a person of character locks themselves up in the prison of their own convictions and they throw away the key some of y'all are loyal and have this power struggle with this concept called loyalty you're so loyal you're watching your career and your life and your surroundings crash and burn because you're being loyal to those friends. They're insecure and threatened by you and anything that you do and any move that you make. They are angry and mad and jealous and envious about anything that you have going. You hold on to things that don't make sense for the new season of your life, but because you actually know them, because you're comfortable with them. You hold on to dead weight People are in your life for a reason. Other people are there for a season. But it's important to recognize when people's seasons are over. Now, keeping in mind our idea that a courageous person is not someone who never feels fear, but who fears the right thing at the right time in the right way. What really scares people about these situations is the sense that they're going to be helpless. That all their trust was placed in somebody or something. And now they've been let down and they can't do anything. They're helpless. 
take your place, make your mark, and live your life. God didn't bring you in this world to wake up and die one day and just be another person that lived and died and didn't do anything significant in this world. You're still alive. So therefore, God is not done with you. Discipline is the root of all good qualities, but you have to absolutely apply it to things outside of just waking up early. It's, it's everything. It's working out, making yourself stronger and faster and more flexible and healthier. It's about disciplining your emotions so you can make good decisions. It's about having the discipline to control your ego so your ego doesn't get out of hand and control you. Character is sacrifice for principles. So character means you are willing to sacrifice friendship to protect your principles. You are willing to lose your best friend in order to keep your principles. The first challenge is for us to find ourselves. And we find ourselves when we discover our purpose. Find that purpose. It's what makes you solid. It's what makes you secure. It's, it's your mooring. It, it keeps you just exactly where you need to be so that you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. And so I think that now more than ever, we must begin to look at what are the things that we can do that will enable us to do some things and, and use some powers that we have that many of us go through life never ever discovering that we have those things going for us. And part of that, I believe, is knowing what it is your life worth. What is it that gives your life a sense of meaning and purpose? A truly confident person's belief in himself is strong enough so that he's able to believe in others. Distrust in yourself breeds distrust in everyone you meet. A confident person gives you confidence. She creates confidence in others. The strength of her character makes you a stronger character. Do you have character? Who are you with right now that you shouldn't be with? Think about it. Society is conspiring all the time in our culture to completely distract you so you never win. To just divert your focus and attention. Look over here. Look at this shiny thing. Worry about what's going on here in this war. And they get these different things on television and our phones and in our lives to just get us distracted so we never get obsessed. We never get laser focused. Ask yourself truthfully, your big goals and dreams, are you really clear on what they are? Because if you don't have that, we can't even get started. Other people will often see how God shaped you before you do. Because when you're naturally good at something, you think everybody's good at it. They're not. And when you're good at something, you just think it's a normal thing. Well, anybody should be able to do that. Well, they, they don't. And so other people will actually have to point it out in you. When the temptations outweigh the benefits, that's all it takes for some very unfortunate things to start happening. In my opinion, and I think there are very few exceptions to this, a bad person is simply somebody who doesn't have enough reasons to be good. Fear kills hope. Fear put people in the hospital. Fear can age you can hold you back from doing something that you know within yourself that you're capable of doing, but it will paralyze you. And I ask you a question, what is the benefit of giving up on yourself, of not stepping out on life and taking life on? What is the benefit for you? What's the plus in that? And so ask yourself what you're willing to risk. What's the price you're willing to pay? Because what most people do when they're trying to chase their dream or their big outcome, the whole time they're negotiating the price in their head. Should I continue to do it? Is it worth it? I don't know if I can continue anymore. It's getting higher and that price is failure. And what happens is if you don't negotiate that price in advance, it's going to steal your focus and energy and become another distraction. When you find your spiritual gift, all of a sudden it'll give you an energy that when you're in the area of your weaknesses, you get tired, don't you? But when you're in the area of your strengths, 
You're energized. Decide to develop the habit right now. The habit of focusing on what's right in your world instead of what's wrong. The habit of focusing on what you do have instead of what you don't have in a situation. Because those habits form the chain of your ultimate character, of who you become and how you end up living your life. We've got to condition ourselves, because if we don't, we'll go back to the automatic state that most people live in in today's society. Wisdom is a unique commodity, if indeed it can even be called a commodity. Unlike the other things people hunger for, wisdom is very hard to visualize. Books aren't wisdom. They're just pieces of paper bound together. Books can help create wisdom in people's mind, but if you look inside their heads, you won't find any wisdom there. Credit goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. Consider joining them to support our work. You can also support us by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell button to get notified when our new videos are released. And as always, thank you for watching. It's an urge. It's an urge. Every champion has felt it. Every king has felt it. Every winner has felt it. Every soldier has felt it. Every victorious person has felt it. The urge to quit. Don't you give up on your dream. I don't care if you don't have the money, and you don't have the help, and you don't have the family for it, and you don't have the background for it, and you don't have the friends for it. Don't you give up on your dream. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. It may take you twice as long. You may have to take courses and classes. You might not read as fast. You might not move as quick. You might not have as much, but don't you quit. Through all the things I've gone through in my life, I had a lot of downs. How did I keep the faith? There was a couple of reasons. Number one, I know from living that if you quit, whatever you're trying to accomplish, if you quit, Whatever you were trying to accomplish can never happen. There's not even a remote possibility. If you quit, there is no chance of it popping back up again, coming back later. Quitting is guaranteed failure. Now, when you're trying, you're going to fail. But quitting, just stopping, that was the number one thing I understood. And then number two, you have to make sure that your dreams, your aspirations and goals are so big that not accomplishing them is not an option. And then the other layer of it is you're probably going to have to have some suffering to get there or some sacrifice to get there. And so once you've embraced and decided that this suffering, this sacrifice you're making is an indicator of progress. It's an indicator of obsession. Suffering and sacrifice and hard work is an indication of progress towards our dreams. The lack of sacrifice, the lack of suffering in our lives, its removal, its non-existence also equates to a non-existence of a great life, a non-existence of a dream happening, a big one anyway. You have to want something so big that it wakes you up in the middle of the night. You have to want something so big that you think about it all the time. You have to want something so big that it drives you to wake up when you don't want to. It keeps you up at night when you long been sleepy. It makes you show up, do things you wouldn't normally do. It requires extra. If you want to be extraordinary and not ordinary, if you want to be ordinary, live your life. And so embrace the fact that you're going to have to sacrifice and suffer to some extent. Once you've embraced that it's going to happen, it's almost not that bad. It's kind of like those of you that are fit. You've sort of accepted that before you go to the gym and get there, you're going to have to suffer. And we go anyway. It becomes a habit. No one goes into a gym thinking, I'm not going to have to sacrifice or suffer. There'll be no discomfort or no pain. 
Yet in life, outside of that one area, most of us we're worried about suffering. We're afraid of it. it. When we're suffering and sacrificing, we wonder whether it's worth it. We wonder whether we're supposed to. We wonder whether sacrifice or setbacks or suffering is a sign it's not our real dream, don't we? See, at the gym, you'd never think, oh, I'm going through some pain and discomfort. This must be a sign I shouldn't be at the gym. You'd never think that. So while it's happening, there's no part of you that says this isn't right. In fact, the indication of the pain and sacrifice and sweat. Don't you feel better at the gym? You're like, wow, I really sacrificed today. I really suffered. So in that area, we all know to the extent we suffer and sacrifice is to the extent we grow. And your body is a metaphor for the rest of your life. But the rest of our life, every time we sweat, every time we sacrifice, every time we suffer, we don't do what we do at the gym. We start saying, well, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this. Maybe I'm not cut out. Maybe it's not my destiny. Maybe I just can't do it. It's the most unbelievable, ridiculous conclusion we draw, but it's what everybody does, which is another form of distraction is doubt. Another form of distraction is just doubt. And doubt comes from the suffer. It comes from a loss. It comes from fear. It comes from the sacrifice. And so just remember this. You're supposed to suffer and sacrifice. So let me ask you a question. What are you willing to risk in order to make your dream come true? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. You're going to take a risk. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's a risk of time. Maybe it's a risk at your job. Maybe it's a risk of looking bad. Maybe it's a risk of failing, of falling on your face, of going broke, of going through pain, of going through anxiety. What are you willing to risk in order to win? The price you will pay for not making your dream come true is far greater than the one that you will pay to make it come true. You'll pay that one the rest of your life. And so ask yourself what you're willing to risk. What's the price you're willing to pay? Never give up until however long that is. Step by step, piece by piece, book by book, go for it. Don't miss the chance to grow and resolve that you'll pay the price until you learn, change, grow, become. Then you'll discover some of life's best treasures when you pay that price, that price, that price, that price, that. Because what most people do when they're trying to chase their dream or their big outcome, the whole time they're negotiating the price in their head. Should I continue to do it? Is it worth it? I don't know if I can continue anymore. It's getting higher and that price is failure. That price is setback. That price is looking back. That price can be financial, literally a physical price. And what happens is, if you don't negotiate that price in advance, it's going to steal your focus and energy and become another distraction. One of the great distractions of chasing our dreams is this thing that goes off in our head as we're negotiating the price we're paying. Is it getting too high? Is it too much? And you'll have people in your ear, it's too big a sacrifice, you're going through too much. And you begin to negotiate it in your mind, it distracts all your focus. You can't be executing and negotiating simultaneously. If you're in your head negotiating and negotiating and negotiating, you can't execute. So negotiate it now. Negotiate it with me now. What are you willing to pay? For me, when I'm after something big, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, I'll sacrifice everything else. But I will not sacrifice anything legal, anything unethical, or anything immoral. But beyond that, I'm going to get it. And I know that negotiation comes up front. I accept the suffering. I accept the sacrifice. I know the sacrifice is far smaller than the one I'll pay if I don't do it. And I eliminate distractions and I go freaking get what I want in my life just like you can. And this needs to be your recipe as well. Successful people don't negotiate the cost of something. They negotiate whether it's worth it. What I'm telling you is if you really want something bad enough, it's worth it. It's worth it. So start to feed yourself the worth question over and over and over again, not the cost question. Cost is a distraction. Worth is a focus mechanism. This is so worth it. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. Focuses you. Cost distracts you. Now, if you don't want to do the extra effort, you finna be regular. There's nothing wrong with being regular. A lot of people are happy being regular. I just wasn't. I ain't want to be regular. If I didn't want no regular house, I didn't want no regular car, I didn't want no regular clothes, I didn't want no regular checking account. I just didn't want it. I wanted to have an exceptional home. I wanted to have an exceptional bank account. I wanted to travel exceptional places. Now, if you don't want that, it's perfectly fine. 
You can be really happy being ordinary. But if something's burning in you, you got to deal with it. If you don't deal with it, you're going to be disappointed, man. See, being regular is cool. It's nothing wrong with it. You get a regular job, regular house, regular car. You get regular money. You go on vacation once a year. That's cool. Okay. Economy ticket, regular. See, let me tell you something. You know what you ought to do? Save your money and buy a first-class ticket. This is how you train yourself to be successful. Save your money, get an upgrade, buy a first class ticket. Because when you sit in first class, you're going to understand something. The seats are wider. You get a choice of meals, chicken, beef, or fish. You get a bowl of warm nuts. They give you a hot towel to wipe your hands. Why do you think when their plane take off, they close the curtain to first class? They cannot let you see what the f is going on up there because you're going to want it back there, but you didn't pay to get it. Hey, what are they doing? They're serving warm nuts. Where's our nuts? Wait a minute. They didn't get charged for the food. Their food was free. They didn't pay for the headsets. They're watching all the movies. Why don't we have that? Because you didn't pay for that. So they closed the curtain so they don't have to deal with your regular ad wondering what's going on in first class. Once you buy a first class ticket, it becomes very difficult now for you to walk past those seats. Because now you're going to know what's going on. So when you treat yourself first class, you are conditioning your mind to now behave and do the things that produce first class results. That's why Dick Gregory said, whenever you can treat yourself first class, you should, because it conditions the mind. Once you fly first class, you never go back. All you gotta do is you can condition yourself. Once you buy a really nice dress, you don't want a cheap dress no more. You want another nice dress. I'm telling you, man, being successful is a mental condition. You can all mentally condition yourself to being successful. Oh, you got it's your mind. You're in control of it. And letting go of fear is the key thing. And when you get to that point where you're observing your mind and you're observing your emotions instead of being them, it's amazing how fear, and I can only talk for my, myself and talking to other people who've been through it, fear starts to leave you. Because what is there to fear when you've reached that point not only of realization, but of observing the world from a point of view of that which is always has been, always will be, um, infinite consciousness, eternal consciousness, which is what we are. The other thing that um, it holds us in servitude is insecurity. How many people are always put a mask to the world? It's, it's not who they really are. It's what they think other people think they should be. So instead of putting ourselves to the world, we put this mask to the world that we think is acceptable to the world. Consciousness does not do insecurity, and it certainly doesn't do putting masks on to fulfill uh, other people's uh, perceptions of what you should be. Consciousness is all possibility. It is um, all potential. You know, people uh, think about, uh, you know, one consciousness and they think oh that means yeah i'm one consciousness yeah i'm one consciousness i'm one consciousness if it's in some clone-like state consciousness uh, in the firm that i'm talking about at the infinite level of us is all possibility therefore when we celebrate our uniqueness and celebrate our diversity and celebrate the diversity and uniqueness of each other, we are celebrating the fact that we are infinite consciousness because we're celebrating all possibility. What happens is when we get caught in mind, that's when you get the clone. Yeah, our mind, yeah, our mind, yes, our mind. All the bloody clones line up, always look, all look the same and all the rest of it and speak the same and think the same. That's mind. So, um, celebrating uniqueness and being conscious are the same things. And that's why if you look, the, the more mind has taken over, the more this, 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 this earth has become more and more uniform.
And as we become more and more conscious, we will be celebrating diversity and diversity will start to return in the way we live our lives. Um, the key thing to breaking the spell is breaking out of belief systems. Um, it's, it's a good question. What would consciousness do? How would consciousness see this? Well, like I said earlier, consciousness doesn't do religion. Because religion is a mind phenomenon that sees everything in terms of um, uh, a partners and rules and regulations and all the rest of it. Consciousness doesn't do that. So religion's out. If we are going to be conscious, then religion's gone. Politics. Well, <laughs> consciousness votes. I mean, what's going on? Consciousness doesn't do belief systems like politics. So that's gone. That belief system. Um, race. It doesn't do race. You know, the, the, the human form is just a vehicle for consciousness to experience this reality. It doesn't do my uh, genetic spacesuit is better than yours and because yours is of different color or comes from a different background. I'm better than you and I'm the master race or I'm the chosen race and all the rest of it. Consciousness doesn't do that. Mind does that. When we think in those terms, we're in mind, not consciousness. And self-identity. If we have a self-identity that says, I am my body and I am my name, and that is me, that is who I am, we're in mind. When we say my name and my, my body and my life is my experience, the experience of my consciousness, then we're recognizing who we really are, which is consciousness having an experience. Yep. What, why do you think these people see the media as being so important? You know, the, the reality is quite different. You know, the, the media isn't really important. It's how we use it. It's how we view it. You know, the, the reality is that, that we, as a society, in this, this hypnotized and almost catatonic and comatose state, we have given our free will for everything that's going on. We've given our free will consent to the state the planet is in today. Most people in modern societies, I mean, you know, we, we, we saturate our minds with all sorts of unhealthy things that are not good for us. I mean, things that are served up for us on television. And people are quite addicted to their televisions. Most people spend their time consuming violence, pornography, greed, selfishness, hatred, you know, incessant bad news and fear and terror. I mean, when was the last time a lot of people out there just, just stopped and thought about something really, really beautiful and, and really pure? You know, something wonderful that really warms your heart and puts that energy into the field. You know, when was the last time you stopped and did that? The planet is the way it is because of our collective thoughts about the planet. And those people out there who, who don't affect positive change, they are complicit in their inaction. And every time you, you look the other way when you see an injustice, your thought at the subconscious level of creation to the creator is your allowance of these things to occur. And in so doing, you're serving the wrong purpose. Those who think violent thoughts against those whom they perceive to be the rulers of this world. Be careful what you wish for, folks, because all thoughts and words are created. And there was a statement I read somewhere, I'm not sure who it was by, that said, in order to choose the positive path, at least 51% of our thoughts and actions must be dedicated to the service of others. But for the negative path, at least 95% of our thoughts and actions must be directed towards self-service. And between those two points lies the sinkhole of indifference. And it's truly a sinkhole, folks. Indifference is the vein of consciousness. To lead you down a path of repetition that becomes ever more negative. You know, It's the will to serve self. And it becomes ever more negative and polarized. Because negativity is necessary, folks. It's very important for without negativity, there can be no positivity. And without the negative, there can't be the positive. It's all about free will and freedom of choice, my friends. And if negativity did not exist, there would be no choice because there would be nothing for us to choose between. It's all about service to self or service to others. That's the whole thing about this life, service to self or service to others. Do the right thing in all that you do, or do what is right for you personally. That's the choice, folks. And it's a pretty easy choice to make once you begin to understand this sort of thing. I choose service to others. And I don't try to wake up people to 
the reality of these things out of fear. I don't try to wake people up to what's going on in the world because I'm worried about the future. I do it because I love you. I do it because I love you all. I truly do. I've never met a person that I didn't love, even the most negative. You know, some people will just say these are evil people. I don't see them as evil. I see them as polarized. And it's necessary for them to be that way. I mean, otherwise they wouldn't be that way. Because having these polarized energies in the world is the only way the consciousness can ascend into something more positive. So can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the event has already happened? Neuroscience says it's absolutely possible. Now, your personality, your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. It's that simple. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality who's sitting here today, you, has created the present personal reality called your life. Would you agree? Would you also agree then if you wanted to create a new personal reality that on a fundamental level you would have to change the thoughts that you are thinking, the behaviors and habits that you're demonstrating, and the emotions that you've memorized that's become part of your identity? And most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it never works. We have to become somebody else. So then as you keep thinking the same thoughts, performing the same actions, and living by the same experiences that produce the same emotions, there's a principle in neuroscience that says nerve cells that fire together wire together. And if you keep repeating the same states of mind and body over and over again, your brain begins to fi fire in the same sequences and the same patterns and same combinations. And whenever you make your brain work in a certain way, that's called mind. Mind is the brain in action. So as you remind yourself every day who you think you are, you're causing your brain to fire in the exact same ways. And as they fire and wire in the same patterns over time, the brain moves into a very finite signature, and that's called your personality. Now that box in your brain isn't literally a box, but it's the most commonly wired, neurologically fired programs that run redundantly because we keep doing the same things over and over again. To change your mind, then, is to make the brain work in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations, to begin to make the brain work differently. And the one ingredient that allows us to do that is knowledge or information. Because every time you learn something new, you make a new connection in your brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new connections. Remembering is maintaining or sustaining those connections. So now, Every time you have a thought, you make a chemical. And if you have a great thought or an unlimited thought or a joyful thought, you turn on a set of circuits in your brain that fires in a very specific sequence, pattern, and combination that produces a level of mind that turns on another part of the brain that makes a chemical for you to begin to feel exactly the way you were just thinking, great or unlimited or joyful, Listen, getting successful, whatever you consider successful, if it's rich, whatever, it's not a magic trick. It's not God picks certain people he'll make rich and certain people he don't. He gives all of us as his children the power of choice. You have a say-so in that. You can decide to be rich. And with God's help, it's highly doable. But you first have to think it. The difference between successful people and non-successful people is here. I'm no better than none of y'all. I'm not a better person than you. I'm not a better Christian than you. God don't love me more than you. None of that. If you want to be successful, you have to change this. This has to change. Listen to me, it's not what makes it hard, 
is your lack of belief that it can happen for you. The fact of it is though, it's very doable. See, if but you got to change though. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. So if you're at a place in your life and you ain't happy with it, you have to change some things. But you have to make a conscientious decision that you're going to change. And it's not dependent on anybody else. It don't matter what your mama think. It don't matter what your coworkers think. It don't matter what your siblings think. It don't matter what your children think. It don't matter. They have nothing to do with it. This decision is yours and yours alone. It's two people born in a hospital every day. It's a person that's born in a hospital that's gonna get a job and somebody born in a hospital that's gonna give them a job. You get to decide which one you gonna be. You get to decide. Let me tell you something. You get to decide if I'm gonna be rich, poor, mediocre, plentiful, happy, sad. You, you have a decision to make. Your mind, all right, here we go. This is the teaching moment. Let me give you this so you can get on with your 2019. You walk in the house, you pick up the remote control. Let me teach you how this works. And you press the power button. When I told you 2019 will be the best year of your life, but you have to claim it. You have to expect it to be the best year of your life. You have to live your life with the expectation that great things are coming your way. And that's how it works. Now let me teach it to you. You grab your remote, you press the power button. What do you expect to happen? You expect the TV to come on. Guess what? It come on. If you want to see Sports Center, Sports Center Channel 46, and you press 46 and OK or select, what do you expect to come on your TV? Sports Center. And guess what show up? Sports Center. They got the concept of creating a remote from the Bible. See, God is tied to all of this. You better understand what I'm trying to tell you. The Bible says a man is as he thinketh. God created us in his image. God thought of this world. He thought of it, so he created it. So he made you just like him, that your thoughts can create things. He made you just like him. Now you can't go make earth and heaven like he did, but you can make a better world for yourself. There is a scripture, Habakkuk 2 and 2. It says, write the vision and make it plain so that he who reads it will run to it. And even though it tarry, tarry means take a long time, wait for it, for surely it will come at an appointed time. That's in the Bible. That ain't in the rich people's copy. That's in everybody, everybody's Bible. The problem is everybody don't do it. But it's right there. But you gotta do it. I'm just telling you, it's, if you don't do it, it's, it's, it's too hard. It's almost impossible. That vision board has changed. Well, everything I put on my vision board, I get. Everything. Now you have to understand something. It's not gonna come when you want it to come. It comes at an appointed time. That's the trick. But the appointed time is what throw people off. Because most of see, when you ask God for something, he sends it, he ships it immediately. Soon as you ask him something, you really believe he'll do it? He boxes it up and he ships it to you immediately. The problem with the package is, he never gives you the date that the package is going to arrive. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Because if he told you the date that the package would, rely, would arrive, it would destroy the requirement he has of all of us, which is faith. 
Faith is the belief in things that you cannot see. So if you ask God for a million dollars and he tell you I'm going to give it to you in March of 2020, you wouldn't need no faith. You'd be talking to people crazy because you know in 2020, <laughs> I'm going to be a millionaire. But he sent a million as soon as you asked for it. But it's going to come at an appointed time. The problem is people stop waiting on the package. Then when it get to you, because he delivers only to Faith Street. When he delivers to you on Faith Street, but you done stepped off of Faith Street, you over here on I Don't See How Circle. He don't ship there. Instead of staying on Faith Street, you done stepped over here to I Don't Believe It Boulevard or It Took Too Long Avenue. Then the package come to Faith Street it's just like the post office in FedEx. If you ain't there to receive it, it got to go back. That's how it works, man. You have control of this. This belongs to you. This is yours. You're the captain. You're the master. You're the foreman. You're the general. You're the head. Don't give control of this to nobody, especially the devil. Do not let Satan come in here and function and operate because he has one mission to keep you off course, to make you not think it's possible, to make you think that God don't hear you. His job is only to destroy you, to make sure that you don't become what God intended for you to become. That's the mission of the devil. Now, if you don't believe in the devil, I, this conversation ain't for you. If you don't believe in God, this conversation ain't for you. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people who are spiritually based. If you get control of this, that's why I'm telling you these two books. I'm, and look, the, the, the best book you can read is the Bible. If you read the book of Proverbs over and over and over, it's the book of wisdom and understanding. It would really help your life, man. If you just read I'm going to be honest with you. That's the only book in the Bible I've read cover to cover. I've only read the book of Proverbs. I've read some scriptures every now and then. I only know five or six scriptures by heart. I'm just going to be real with you. But I've memorized them five or six scriptures. And them five or six got me here today. I know a lot of people that know the Bible inside out ain't got nothing to show for it. You know why? Because they memorized it, but they didn't apply it. I have applied six scriptures to change my life. But these books that I told you about, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale and The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz, you know what it does? It just teaches you how this works. Once you get this, y'all, you can change everything. Do you understand negativity? Let me just give you this and I'm gonna walk away. Negativity, you can protect yourself from negativity. And that's what stops most people negative thoughts. You can coat your mind from negativity. It's a real simple exercise to do. I do it every morning before I walk out the door. So I walk out as a positive person. You know, I get tired sometimes. That's different from being negative because I get mentally drained from my job at times. But to coat your mind from negativity, the way you can put a coating around your mind is with one simple thing, gratitude. Gratitude erases negativity. I'm gonna show you how this works. If you wake up in the morning and you start having negative thoughts, man, this ain't my day. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm tripping, I just don't feel myself. Every time you feel, in the middle of the day, if you feel yourself doing that, stop, just stop for a second. And start going over in your mind everything you have to be grateful for. Not everything you want, everything you already have because what you have is substantial. You just haven't gone over the list and taken inventory in a long time. But the fact that you can walk, that's a blessing. The fact that you woke up, that's another blessing. The fact that you can see, think, reason, that's another blessing. The fact that you can go somewhere and get yourself something to eat, that's another blessing. The fact that you can go and turn the key and call some place home, that's another blessing. The ability to dream is a blessing. The, the, the fact that you have an opportunity to get it right is another blessing. The fact that you're beautiful, 
that's another blessing. The fact that you have any measure of health, that's another blessing. And I'm just talking to you, I don't even know you. I could give you 50 things you ought to be grateful for right now. I don't even know you. Start coating your mind with gratitude. It'll change everything for you. God is good, man. You ought to give him a chance to work in your life. Thank y'all for coming.